You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Lately, I've been thinking about getting a dog. I'm at home more, and it would be so nice to have some company. Maybe you've been thinking about it too. There's the question of responsibility, you know, can I take care of it? And cost, am I able to afford it? But then there's the fun part. What kind of dog am I going to get? You're scrolling through the shelter website, looking at the cute photos of pups with their tongues out. And this is my favorite part, reading the descriptions of what they like to do and eat. I read one the other day that was like, Scotty is a sun-loving cowboy. Scotty being the dog, of course. (laughs) This boy's fixing to move on out of the city to a place where y'all can see the stars and hear the wind blowing through the trees. And yes, there's the case for responsible breeders and adopting from shelters. But at the heart of it, when you're looking at photos or meeting them in person, you're just looking for a connection. Lyndall Moody first met her dog, Iggy Joey, about six years ago. Iggy because it's an Italian greyhound, and Joey because she kind of looks like a little kangaroo. And she was just this lanky little weird dog that, so skinny, ran into the house and jumped on my sofa. And I was like, oh, she loves me. Like, she's like made herself at home. (laughs) The breeder brought the four-month-old pup to Lyndall's house and let her get acquainted. There was another dog there too, but it was Iggy Joey who pulled her in. And then I, eventually she came into my lap and I was like, yeah, there's no way I'm like not keeping this little dog. Lyndall was so obsessed with her new pup that she filled her Instagram account with pictures of Iggy Joey. Joey sleeping, Joey eating, Joey out for a walk. Her followers, mostly friends and family, were getting a little tired of the dog content. So she decided to make the pup an account of her own. I posted a few photos with the hashtags uh, Italian Greyhound and straight away she was getting followers. And I actually... I ordered her some onesies, and once I started posting those, people just loved it. You know, a star was born. (laughs) Just picture that for a second. A 13-ish pound creature that somehow resembles a baby kangaroo, if a baby kangaroo can walk on four legs, and she's wearing a onesie. How cute is that? Well, so cute that it blew up. Iggy Joey now has nearly 80,000 followers. And since those first few posts, she's turned into somewhat of a fashion icon. Now, brands are sending her clothes to model on her grid. She's walked the runway in New York, starred in a Mercedes commercial. And she even collaborated with Zara on a t-shirt with her picture on it. But get this, there are people who have Iggy Joey tattoos. I think there's six people that I know of in the world that have Iggy Joey tattoos, and I don't have one. Do you think people, like, love her? Like, is that uh, an exaggeration? Humans, we really like to humanize animals. If that, uh, that probably doesn't make sense. But sometimes she'll get a look on her face, and you know what that look is. You know it's, like, she's annoyed or she's sassy. And when you pair that with a caption, it, it humanizes her. So I think that's why people care, and I hope they love her. We want to see something in this little pup that we see in ourselves. But all those followers aside, those people who have her tattooed on their bodies, there's one person who will always be more obsessed than the rest. Well, I have like four. Actually, hold on, let me think about that. I have five Iggy Joey shirts now. My fridge is covered in Iggy Joey magnets. There's stickers everywhere. I've got like... Iggy Joey pictures everywhere. I'm pretty sure, like, it's safe to say I'm her biggest fan. Today, we're going to find out what's behind that connection we feel with animals. How can we care so deeply and so passionately for beings that look nothing like us? I am Stephanie Phillips. And this is Paradigm. As a dog. Woof, woof, woof. Producer Joe Fish brings us this story, which starts in Australia. So over the last year or more, residents started reporting a bit of unusual behaviour 
um, such as big holes dug in their gardens, missing cat food, missing dog food, flower beds dug up, strange footprints. Longford is a town in northeastern Tasmania, an island in the Pacific that's technically a part of Australia. Now, Longford only has about 4,000 inhabitants, and in a town that small, word tends to travel quickly. In January of 2019, the town was abuzz as an increasing number of residents awoke to find that their homes had been ransacked in the night. And it wasn't long before a theory began circulating about the identity of the vandal. With more, here's Tasmanian journalist Georgie Burgess. So the local newspaper was on to this from the beginning with reports of maybe a rogue wombat terrorising residents. A few residents were sure it was a wombat. Some of them report that their wives didn't believe them that it was a wombat terrorising them in the night. And so some residents actually had security camera vision that caught the wombat entering their properties at night, sniffing around the garage. And there were some eyewitness accounts as well with one elderly resident waking to a wombat trotting down their hallway in the middle of the night. Wombats are marsupials native to Tasmania, as well as the southern and eastern parts of mainland Australia. They've been described as resembling a mixture between a bear and a giant guinea pig. They're typically about a meter long, and they can weigh up to 40 kilograms. They have rodent-like faces and squat, muscular bodies that include an extremely tough, protective posterior. So prodigious are their butts, in fact, that during the 2000 Sydney Olympics, two local TV hosts created a character named Fatso the fat Arse Wombat, who became even more popular than the game's official mascots. A little guy The people have taken to their hearts. Actually, and it's not only people in Australia. Fatso the big Arse Wombat talks to people of the whole world. Yeah. The That's whole true. world That's see true. him as a, as a mascot that does celebrate humanity. There are three species of wombat, with subtle variations among them. Now, the animal that terrorized Longford was what's known as a common wombat. The common wombat is the fuzziest of the three species, and probably the cutest. In other words, the last thing you'd picture when you think of a criminal. Here's Georgie again, talking about how one Longford resident found themselves face to face with what I'm choosing to call the Wom Bandit. There was a wombat trotting down her hallway and then it all made sense. So that was an elderly resident called Bev and she actually named this rogue wombat Mr. Bat. And so, yeah, this wombat Mr. Bat is the culprit for terrorising these residents over a year or more. It's likely this wombat was hand-reared and then this person has tried to do the right thing by releasing the wombat back into the wild, but he hasn't been able to adjust, and so he's going back to what he knows. So Mr. Bat wasn't acting out of malice. He just wasn't provided with the tools he needed to survive out in the broader world. And as a 26-year-old man, who until recently still lived at home with his mommy and daddy, I find the sentiment eminently relatable. Well, Parks and Wildlife staff um, managed to catch him and he was taken to a lovely place called Cradle Mountain, which is home to many, many wombats. It's, it's, it's wombat heaven. There's endless grass. There's lots of, lots of flat button grass plains where they can make burrows to live. I don't know if you guys have this in Australia, but in North America, um, typically when an animal becomes unruly, like say a, a family dog or something, we're told that he's gone to live at the farm. We, we have that here as well, but I can assure you Mr. Bat didn't go to the farm. He really did get taken to Cradle Mountain. <laughs> the only time I've ever seen a wombat in person was in the winter of 2019. While Mr. Bat was probably having his way with a chaise lounge in Tasmania, I was walking into the Australasia Pavilion at the Toronto Zoo with my girlfriend, Emma. And that's where I first saw it, a southern hairy-nosed wombat sitting on its fortified badonk, doing absolutely nothing. I was spellbound. It was the stupidest thing I had ever seen, and I mean that in the best possible way. I love animals, and despite the moral dubiousness of imprisoning them in small pens in northern Scarborough, I love the zoo. I've loved it since a field trip in the sixth grade, during which I saw a gorilla vomit on the floor and then eat it immediately after. It was 
the best thing ever. I've seen a lot of different animals inside and outside of zoos, but nothing, and I mean nothing, has had as profound an effect on me as the wombat has. I became obsessed, and I want to figure out why this Australian marsupial has grabbed me unlike anything else. And in order to do that, I figured the best place to start would be at the beginning. And so I decided to talk to the only person who was there to bear witness to that life-altering meeting. Tell me what you remember about the day that we went to the zoo. Big zoo over here funding this. <laughs> I just want to state for the record that Big Zoo <laughs> is providing no funding for this podcast. I just want to make that abundantly clear. Follow the money, it always goes back to Big Zoo. I remember that we saw the baby hippo, the uh, miniature hippo, and we saw the orangutans, which I love. And I don't remember seeing a wombat, but you've told me that we have. <laughs> it's like a blank in your memory. <laughs> no, I'm telling you it's not a blank. I just remember more important things like the pygmy hippo and the orangutan. I was shocked that Emma seemed to recall nothing about an event that seemed so poignant in my own recollection. But I wasn't ready to give up. I decided to put her through a battery of memory exercises to try and force her mind into high gear. What do we what do we have for lunch that day? Oh, we had Chris Jerk. Who was the runner up uh, during uh, RuPaul's Drag Race season four? Uh, season four was uh, Sharon Needles who won it. So Fifi and Chad Michaels, and then. Like a miracle. Was there a handler with the wombat when we went? There was a handler. (gasps) I remember. You remember we had a whole conversation with her. Yes. Oh, my God. Now that her memory was jogged, I wanted her opinion on why I developed a seemingly instantaneous affinity for the wombat. What about the wombat do you think spoke to me on (laughs) on such a personal level? Okay, um, here's what I think. You do this thing every time you see an animal that's like, and the animal's nice to you. And then you say, they're not doing this to anybody else. This, this is just me. And you tell this whole new reality in which this animal and you have a very personal connection, but you do that to every animal you meet. Remember when we went to the petting zoo? And the N- goat? And what the happened donkey? at the petting zoo? Well, if we went... We went apple picking and we went into the petting zoo at the apple farm and it was supposed to be for like a second because it was for children and there was a line of children and you refused to leave for like 20 minutes because the sheep really liked you, I guess, or you just were feeding them so they kept coming back. But you kept saying, Em, Em, look, like they're not doing this to anyone else. I'd say, I know, just to placate you. Despite her jealous denial, of the very real connection between me and that lamb. What Emma said did have a certain ring of truth to it. It is entirely possible that this imprisoned Australian marsupial took a chance glance in my direction, and out of that one fleeting moment, I managed to fabricate an entire narrative of kinship. But it also seemed a bit simplistic to me. I put forward a competing theory of why I thought a wombat in particular would appeal to me on such a personal level. Wombats are made up of these disparate elements that seem to be grabbed from other parts of the animal kingdom. So they have these like silly rodent looking faces. They've got these muscular squat bodies. And then they have these rumps, like just these butts that are so tough. My love for the wombat might come from the fact that um, it's from the fact that I too am assembled out of contradictions. Shut up. <laughs> I fucking hate that. <laughs> I didn't think you'd understand. <laughs> Horribly obnoxious thing to say. <laughs> Emma clearly didn't think much of my theory, but I wanted a second opinion. I decided to run it by my friend, Marcus Gomez, who's a stand-up comedian originally from Perth, Australia, and currently living in Toronto. 
We met while both competing in a comedy competition. What's going on? I just want to thank Bong uh, for the opportunity to lose the respect of everyone I know in one fell swoop. <laughs> he won, and afterwards, he acted like a total dickhead about it. So I trusted Marcus to give me his honest opinion. Let me phrase it like this. Wombats are a bizarre-looking creature. They're one of those animals that kind of looks like they shouldn't be, kind of akin to a platypus. Like, they've yeah. got these sort of, these cute rodent heads um, sort of thing. They got those weird claws, and then they just, they have those butts that are just... Mm, they just don't quit. Um, they don't quit. They, yeah. they have butts that don't quit, and they, they're just this big adorable muscle. Like, they're just raw power. So let me ask you this. Do you think maybe I love the wombat because I, similarly, am a collection of all of these attributes that don't really fit together properly to create a, a, cohesive, a cohesive whole? Like, maybe I'm... Maybe nope. I'm... <laughs> Maybe I am am similarly assembled out of contradictions, like the wombat. Firstly, no one has ever described you as muscular. Okay, <laughs> let's just get this out of the way. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna sk skate over that. No one has ever said that about you. <laughs> <laughs> but and you, so you don't think there's any credence to that theory at all? I mean, there's there's things that you said about the wombat that could be applied to yourself. Yes, it uh, doesn't make sense. Yeah, I heard your comedy. Uh, <laughs> it uh, <laughs> rodent face that makes sense. I, <laughs> yeah, so I can see, I can see exactly what you mean. <laughs> it is fucking rodent face and doesn't make sense and shouldn't be. Yes, yeah, so I actually know y'all. You said a lot of things that does make sense. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Some of the more astute listeners will be quick to point out that there are no wombats in Perth, Australia. And Marcus, therefore, probably has no idea what he's talking about. You also might be thinking that for a comedian, he doesn't sound that funny at all. And I have to agree with you. I really don't understand what all the hype is about. What I needed now is to consult with somebody with expertise in the wombat to get a better idea of what makes them tick. We'll be back after a quick break. So don't go anywhere. How would you describe Arthur's personality? Um, Arthur, I would say, is a little bit reserved in general. How would you describe uh, Matilda? Um, I would say she's maybe a little more either confident or outgoing than Arthur is. Um, she definitely knows what she wants and expects to get it. He could be talking about my Bubby and Zadie, or anyone's Bubby and Zadie, for that matter, but he isn't. That's Brent Huffman, the lead keeper of mammals at the Toronto Zoo, talking about Arthur and Matilba. Yes, that's Matilba with a B, the two southern hairy-nosed wombats that currently live at the Toronto Zoo. Wombats are extremely hard to keep in captivity, mostly due to their legendary penchant for digging. In the wild, the wombat can dig burrows up to 30 meters long and 4 meters deep. The zoo has gone to great lengths to ensure that Arthur and Matilba don't stage a Shawshank-style escape. The walls of the, of the exhibit go down um, about 4 feet beneath the surface of the soil. And then uh, across the entire bottom of the, of the whole habitat is a chain-link fence. Their unique physiology also poses a challenge. Wombats have continuously growing incisors. So they're kind of like uh, rodents in that way. Their teeth continue growing. And so um, diet is really important or selection of a diet that helps wear down their teeth um, naturally. Um, and even still, our wombats um, generally need to visit the dentist uh, once or twice a year, uh, just to make sure that their teeth are wearing down properly. Okay, I have Mrs. Goldstein at 2, and then Matilba, the wombat, at 2.15. <laughs> no, no, it's a, a veterinary dentist that comes and helps us. 
Brent also revealed to me the reason behind their world-famous bums. When wombats feel threatened, they'll go down into a burrow, and the burrows are basically just as big as their bodies. And uh, so they, they plunk themselves in a tight, tight corner within their burrow, and then that, that dermal seal, that really thick skin on their bum, basically acts like a plug. So anything, uh, whether it's a predator or another wombat that's trying to get in after them, basically comes up to a door that they can't get through. I know what your next question is going to be, and it was mine too. A couple of challenges that uh, have typically been recognized are just individual compatibility. So just like with, um, with people, sometimes wombats just don't get along and will not breed. We have seen some breeding behavior between Arthur and Matilda. Uh, we just have never had, a, as far as we know, a successful pregnancy. Um, and certainly never any Joey that has uh, survived to the point where they're emerging from the pouch. I guess it's not as, it's not as simple as throwing on some Marvin Gaye and lighting a scented candle. <laughs> yeah, it's a, definitely a lot more uh, complicated than that. I was as shocked as you are to find out that the aphrodisiac quality of Marvin Gaye's voice may not translate across species. I just had one more question that I needed to ask Brent. And at this point, it's one that may seem familiar to you. Okay, so um, we, we've, met, we've both mentioned that the wombat is sort of a strange creature. Um, I think it's, it's kind of akin to a platypus in the sense that it almost seems to be this weird amalgam of traits that belong to a bunch of different animals, right? So it's almost got like a rodent face and then it's got this um, this muscular body, and then it's also got that that tough, um, fortified rump. So um, my theory was that maybe I feel such a deep kinship with the wombat because maybe I too am similarly assembled out of contradictions. <laughs> but I think whenever whenever people see animals that don't necessarily fit into fit into a neat category like it's not a cat it's not a cow and it's not a horse i think that curiosity really can inspire people to to connect with them in in a way that you might not expect i think brent was on to something Human beings tend to react in strange ways to things that defy simple categorization. Like hot dogs, for example. Are they a sandwich? A roll? We don't know. And therein lies the source of their enduring appeal. I'm not sure Brent thought much of my theory, but I also don't think his response was enough to make me dismiss it outright. What I needed now was to talk to somebody who shares my deep, unrequited love for the animal. Yep, okay, so we are a wombat hospital in the Hunter Valley, Cedar Creek. Um, mainly do car accidents, dog attacks, um, anything serious with a wombat. We try to do everything we possibly can. We also work alongside members of the public who find a little baby and think that it's okay to raise, which it isn't if they're not experienced. That cute, cuddly baby is and will turn on you. That's Roz Holm. And for the last four decades, she has dedicated her life to caring for sick and injured wombats. Now to me, that sounds like a dream come true. But as you're about to hear... It's been far from a walk in the park. I've been um, attacked. I've had broken bones. I've had my legs smashed. Um, I've been bitten that many times because we actually go out and treat wombats in the field. So obviously they're wild. Um, they do make a, a gnashing noise with their teeth and a growl. Um, and they just run at you. So if you're not quick on your feet, and me these days aren't very quick on my feet. Um, I, I do get attacked at least probably a couple of times a week, maybe. <laughs> I learned from Roz that love for the wombat may not be as universal as I previously thought. 
Well, the farmers, are, and believe me, I've been a farmer too, so um, some of the farmers just go, oh, they've wrecked my fence or they dig holes. Yes, they dig burrows. They've actually nearly undermined my whole house. Roz isn't being hyperbolic. The foundation of her house has actually become so compromised from wombats having dug under it repeatedly that her and her husband are now constructing a new place to live. But even after being attacked countless times and literally having been dug out of house and home, Roz remains as committed to wombats as ever. So I really wanted her opinion on why so many people might find wombats so appealing. Um, I feel because they're a, they're a naughty child. People love the naughtiest, naughty bits of the wombat. Um, a lot of people, once they get to know a wombat, know that they've got a huge brain too. But they're just lovable. I, I've always loved them, and I never really think any different. I now had several competing theories for the origins of my wombat mania. If only there was some sort of expert in the field of human-animal relations who could help me separate the wheat from the chaff. I am uh, Beth Daly. I am an anthrozoology professor at the University of Windsor, and I teach anthrozoology, which is the study of human-animal interactions. Before we delve deeper into my own story, I wanted to know more about what in general leads to feelings of affection between humans and beasts. There is a really fascinating theory, and that is the theory of neoteny. And what neoteny says is that we are attracted to creatures that have heads too big for their bodies and eyes too big for their heads and uh, their tiny little bodies. And so for some reason, Humans are, for some reason, you know, we know the reason, people tend to be attracted to things that are, quote, cute. It's called the cute factor. Neoteny is called the cute factor. So we are attracted to babies for obvious reasons, especially women, right? They have to be nurtured and neoteny tricks us into taking care of babies. So the theory of neoteny suggests that if we're attracted to something really cute, big eyes, big head, we will nurture and take care of the, the, the organism. And so it was time for me to get Beth's take on the theories that I collected along the way. I spoke to a woman named Roz Holm, who runs a wombat hospital in Australia. <laughs> and this woman has, uh, she's actually been attacked hundreds of times by these wombats that she cares for. <laughs> um, she's broken bones. Oh, she's had uh, she's had mange before. So, oh my goodness! So, if anyone has has a reason to dislike the animal, it's her. And yet, after four decades of abuse, she loves them more than ever. Um, wow! So, I, I asked her for her theory um, about why what the the appeal of the wombat is, and she said that people are attracted to their naughtiness. Mm, yes, yes, yeah, of course. Well, we know this, and and um, this is the whole theory of dating, right? Is that especially with young people, and you know, there's been movies made out of this that we are attracted to people who are bad for us, and the theory is that we see in in, in others something we would like to be, but we're not. Next, I recounted to Beth the incident at the petting zoo and relayed Emma's assertion that I manufacture relationships with animals out of thin air. Do you, do you know about the oxytocin? I don't. Okay, so this is really being heavily explored in the literature right now. One of the uh, oxytocin makes animals bond, um, dog the dog human bond. There is a lot of people that believe the the same thing that that happens between women and their and their babies, which is a bonding uh, hormone. That um, oxytocin is produced when we look at our dogs and when we're sitting petting with our dogs, it, oxytocin is produced. So this idea of you interacting with the lamb. And the more time you spent together as you're petting, looking at the lamb, the lamb's looking at you, it's very possible that there was oxytocin at play here. I think you already know what comes next. A wombat, when you look at it, is sort of, it's sort of, it's a very strange looking creature. I don't know if it really conforms so neatly, as you said, to that idea of neoteny. 
So no. I'm looking at one now. It's kind of yeah, right. Guinea pig meets little bear or something, exactly. right? Exactly. So, and especially the one that I saw, with, which was a southern hairy-nosed wombat, which tends to be even more so. <laughs> um, so the wombat, it's sort, so it has this face. Um, it, it sort of looks like an amalgamation of these sort of disparate features from other parts of the animal kingdom. Mm-hmm. So it, it has this sort of rodent face with these beady yeah. eyes, right? Mm-hmm. And then it has this sort of um, squat, extremely muscular body. Um, and it has like this, so they have these really tough, protective butts too, that, that help them in their dealings with their natural predators. So, so Well, I can't wait to hear your theory here. <laughs> <laughs> so having said all that, maybe my uh, affinity for the wombat stems from the fact that I, too, am assembled out of contradictions. Oh, isn't that nifty? So you think the wombat is a projection of yourself, isn't it? So it was like looking into the mirror? In a certain <laughs> sense, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know what you look like, but maybe, I mean, it's quite possible. Listen, this is interesting. You're not off. Stanley Corin wrote and published an article about why people have animals, that dogs that look like them. And I don't know that you necessarily look like a wombat. But there is certainly enough in the literature that says that, you know, there's a reason that people are attracted to animals that look like them. And it could be that there must be maybe there's something in the wombat that you see in yourself. I mean, that I don't think that theory is far off at all. And I think it, it not only answers the question about why we're attracted to certain breeds of dogs or certain animals, but obviously in human life, why we're attracted to certain people, mm. you know. And, uh, you know, it is. You're right. It's a, that's actually. Yeah. So I'm not, I think that's a great theory. And I think you should run with that. Not only did Dr. Daly not reject any of my theories, she actually muddied the water even further by putting forth one of her own. You see, in a previous life, I worked in scientific research, and my job involved experimentation with mice and rats. Anyone familiar with that world knows that these experiments don't often end too well for the participants. Dr. Daly suggested that Arthur the Wombat's vaguely rodent-like features may have triggered feelings of guilt for past misdeeds against animal kind, and that maybe I mistook this guilt for affection. After my conversation with Beth, it dawned on me that I'd never know for certain why I had such a visceral reaction to the Wombat. Maybe the Wombat is attractive as the bad boy of the Australian continent. Maybe all animal love is simply an illusion, a confabulation of the human psyche. Maybe we love the animals we love because we see traits in them that we recognize in ourselves. Or maybe Beth was right, that my feelings were a strange manifestation of guilt. It's a tangled mess of psychological and chemical forces that lead us to feel the complicated range of emotions that we simplistically refer to as like or dislike. Why didn't I leave the zoo that day obsessing over pygmy hippos or Peruvian tree frogs? And if I can't get a definitive answer on a simple question like why wombats, then what does it say about more complicated or consequential life decisions like who we choose as romantic partners or the professional pursuits that occupy the bulk of our time between the delivery room and the grave? I don't have any answers for you. I wish I did. But through talking to people, I have learned one thing for certain. And that's that the world would be a better place if we all just had a bit more wombat within us. I want to end this episode with one final theory. Now, Beth casually let this one slip towards the end of our conversation, and I feel that it warrants a mention. It may be that everything we're thinking, it may be everything that we've done in this world is all the research we've done is for naught, you know? It's just because they're so cute. (laughs) Paradigm is presented by the Frequency Podcast Network. It's created by Annalisa Nielsen and me, Stephanie Phillips. This episode was produced by Joseph Fish. Sound mixing by Ryan Clark. And a special thanks to Peter Baker George for reassurance that even dumb stories can be worthwhile. 